Ambler, I'm the Chief Methodologist for IT at uh, IBM Rational. And what I'd like to talk about right now is some work that I've been doing over the last few years uh, called the Agile Scaling Model. And the goal is to describe a, uh, a framework around which people can understand what Agile, uh, you know, how they're applying Agile, the context in which they find themselves in. And it's interesting, uh, you know, the previous speaker was joking that, you know, the consultant, you know, everybody jokes about this, that the, the consultant answer is it, it depends. Well, I would really like it if people were to, you know, take the, follow up on that and say, well, on what? Because that, that's an interesting question. And um, this is the answer to, uh, well, on what? At least some, some of it will be at least. So, um, so keep that in mind. So, ah, it's not working. So I want to talk about three basic things. I'm going to, I'm going to start out, first of all, by uh, talking about what the Agile Scaling Model is. because It's a fairly light thing, um, which I hope, hopefully, we'll be able to convince you of. It's fairly light and fairly straightforward. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to explore two basic issues. You know, how is, how does, how will, how is this scaling model, how would it affect the common practices that you're probably used to? Um, we'll look at daily stand-ups and stuff like that, and we'll see how you would scale them. Um, and this will be, and you've probably heard some of this already from other speakers, um, as well as what are some of the other practices that you might want to adopt. Now, I'm not going to go through every single freaking scaling practice there is. This would be a, a several day talk if that was the case. Uh, and I'm certainly not going to go through every uh, agile practice and show you how to scale them all because that would also be several days because there's, there's 80 or 90 common agile practices. And, and even if it takes me you know, a couple minutes to walk through each one, which would be very short, um, that's still half a day of material, and I'm, I've got 60 minutes. Uh, and then finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about organizing large teams. Now, part of my message here today is that there's far more to scaling than uh, worrying about large teams, and actually large teams is a relatively trivial thing. But the, I, I just want to talk a little bit about large teams to uh, give, give some advice around that, and then... Um, get, you, get you thinking a bit outside the box. And uh, I almost wish I'd given this presentation earlier today because some of the questions that I was hearing in other people's presentations, I think the, you know, they could have um, uh, benefited from a, a couple of diagrams I'm going to show here about how large teams are actually uh, implemented in, uh, in Agile. So what's the Agile scaling model all about? Um, it's a, it's a three-level or three-category model, and the, at the first level, the first category um, is Agile development in general. And, you know, this is typified by Scrum, by extreme programming. Um, the focus is almost always on construction. You know, we see this, um, we see this a lot. That's, that's great, great place to start. Um, the goal of Agile development is generally to, to develop high-quality high quality software, um, you know, build it in an, ev in an evolutionary, iterative, incremental manner, uh, be very collaborative, be self-organizing. This is something that um, hopefully you've been hearing about over the last three days, so um, this isn't new. The, it's a, it has a value-driven life cycle, so in Scrum, the rhetoric is we produce potentially shippable software every sprint or every iteration, depending on your terminology. So we're producing visible value at all points in time, and isn't, you know, that's, that's a good idea. Um, without a doubt, in the Agile Manifesto talks about how the, you know, the only, you know, the value, yeah, the measure, the only way to measure progress on development project is the delivery of working software. And, uh, so it's all good stuff. And for the most part, a lot of the advice is around small and reasonably co-located teams doing fairly straightforward stuff. And that, without a doubt, is actually the majority of teams. You know, so, um, you know, near located at least, not, not uh, co-located. But, you know, the majority of, of software development teams are, you know, 10, or, 10, 10 people or less. They are roughly, you know, near located. So we're sort of in the same building or same campus. And, they're, and for the most part, most people are developing reasonably straightforward things. You know, there's only a few, there's really only a few teams out there in the world that are developing air traffic control systems or, you know, met, you know heart uh, heart monitoring systems, or um, you know the Watson system to you know to play video or to play games and stuff like that. So they're they're really you know the vast majority of projects are reasonably straightforward. So that's okay. So this is a, a decent niche uh, for Agile to focus on. You know the majority of teams, um, but there's more to it than that, right? This is the problem. And some of the questions I've been hearing in in other people's talks over the last couple of days were around these issues that aren't being you know dis aren't being uh, 
described all that, all that well. So it's not about construction, just about construction, it's about delivery, right? So I've got to be able to say, how do I initiate a project effectively? How do I do the construction stuff effectively? How do I release into production effectively? I mean, if you've got a DevOps type of, a, a, a type of an attitude, and there's a, a DevOps track here, um, it's an interesting question, how do I operate and support the solution effectively? How do I do portfolio management? effectively? How do we do enterprise architecture effectively? Yeah, look at the bigger picture type stuff. Right? So there's a, a bunch of questions that's not being well addressed um, by just this construction focus that we, we like to talk about in the Agile community. Um, Value-driven life cycles are nice and, and they're you know, definitely a good idea and they definitely pay down some risks, but um, delivering working software on a regular basis does not pay, um, pay down all risks. So we know at the beginning of a project It'd be really nice if we'd ha we'd have some sort of agreement around what we're supposed to be doing. It'd be really nice if we had a clue what the architecture was, so we could go in a in a you know in a reasonably good direction to begin with. Um, we should you know we should have be um, you know worrying about these basic fundamental risks, and we should try to try to address them very early in the life cycle if we possibly can. So this is about governance, it's about portfolio management, whatever you want to call that. Um, we we need to work a little bit smarter. So it's not just about showing working software on a regular basis. Um, it was interesting, the, the, the talk, the, the, the gentleman that we were talking about regulatory compliance a while ago, um, they used slightly different terminology, but they both showed um, life cycles that had an explicit init project initiation. Well, actually, one gentleman was talking, using the term inception, um, the other one, I can't remember what he was talking about, but it was, he's basically showing you, you do a little bit of upfront work, then you do a bunch of construction, then you do a bunch of release work. And they both had this very clear cadence in their life cycles. They used slightly different terminology, but um, that's basically what they're talking about. This is, this is you know, having a full delivery life cycle. Um, Self-organization is nice, and, and it's actually quite effective, but you need some adult supervision. So you should be doing this within the scope of an appropriate governance framework. And all teams, by the way, are being, and I realize governance is a swear word, and I, I, I apologize for using that swear word, but like it or not, um, all agile teams are governed in some way. Like it or not. Okay, this is the real world now, not the, not the scrum fantasy certification stuff. This is real world. And you know this to be true because somebody is funding your project. So somebody at least is keeping an eye on you and how the money is being spent. That's governance, that's financial governance. And if you're really smart and you want to be really effective, You'll also know that you need technical governance. You should be working to common coding conventions. This is actually built into XP, by the way. Um, you, should be, you should be working to a common um, infrastructure. You should be reusing as much as you can. You should be, uh, if, there, if you're on a regulatory compliance situation, you should be following the regulations. So there's some basic fundamental governance things that you better be doing. Um, otherwise, you're going to get a spanking at some point from senior management for not doing, not doing your jobs properly. Um, so yeah, you need this adult, adult supervision, um, you know, one of my colleagues likes to say. And, but this is still um, geared for you know, reasonably small teams developing fairly straightforward stuff, um, with the exception of um, that one, one word, solution, not just software. And I was, I was ranting about this this morning. Um, this focus on software is not helping us in this community. It, it, it makes us sound like idiots. Actually, it's very clear. All these people are running around working software, working software, working software. Um, you've just labeled yourself a junior employee, by the way, when you when you start talking like this, because it's not just software that we're we're producing. We're also, you know, we also deliver supporting um, documentation, and documentation is in fact part of Agile. I, I would uh, invite you to Google the term Agile documentation and, and see you know, see what see what comes up. And because there's deliverable documentation, there's going to be some operations uh, documentation you're going to need. There's probably going to be some, uh, it might be some user guides, some training manuals that you need. There might be some uh, system overview documentation that you leave behind for you know, maybe yourself or for somebody, or for somebody else to, to overview the system. Um, you know, let alone, you know, to, so that way you can maintain and support it over time. You know, let alone if you're in a regulatory environment and you, know, you, want, to, you, know, you want to avoid a few fines by producing some of the, the extra documents that, that the regulations uh, ask for. So, there's, uh, so we, we need to worry about that sort of stuff. The software runs on hardware, and almost always, in any system I've ever produced, um, there's been hardware upgrades. 
you know, you do a major release and you're, you're, you're probably going to throw, you know, throw a little more hardware in a production, or somebody else will, you know, maybe the operations people will, if you're running in a cloud, then, you know, somebody's slapping some boards in there uh, at some point to keep things running. But there's, uh, you know, something's happening and the network's changing, all good sort of stuff. The business process is changing. The, uh, you might even be changing the organizational, uh, uh, organizational structure on the usage of your system. So you really got to be looking at the solution, not just the software. The software's part of the solution, but it's only part. So we really got to be looking at the full picture, and, and we've lost, you know, we, in many ways, we've lost this in the Agile community from all the rhetoric and, you know, all the, all the you know, questionable training that we get sometimes. Um, the, we've really lost this, and, and in the, before Agile, um, we had sort of matured to the point that we recognized that there was more to it than just software, and then we sort of backtracked a bit with the, but anyways, so, you know, let's, you know, up our game and, and look at the big picture. Uh, and, and it's not just um, sh potentially shippable software, it's really consumable software. Who, you know, it's nice that the software runs, but it'd be even nicer if, it, if the end users actually wanted to use it. That would be really nice. And, 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 and I'm sure many of you have seen systems that got shipped that were wonderful. They were great systems, they met their requirements, people loved, you know, you know people signed off on it, and then you ship, you ship it into production, you ship it in the marketplace, nobody wants to use it, nobody buys it. That might not have been all that successful, I, I will contend. Um, so then the, the third level, agility at scale, is what happens when the situation is not so simple. And I'll, I'll walk you through this in a few minutes. So what happens when there's one or more scaling factors and you're, you're not in this simple situation anymore? And so how do you tailor your process to, and tailor your tooling to meet the needs? So let's walk through these um, three categories real quickly. So, this is the Scrum life cycle. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, um, so I'm not going to I'm not going to belabor the point. So, very clearly focused on the construction part of the life cycle, which is important. Very important. Good stuff. Great ideas. You you should probably consider adopting them. But as we know, there's more to it. Yes, there's construction, without a doubt. So that's all good stuff. But we need to kick the project off somehow. We're going to do a little bit of uh, you know, initial planning up front, a little bit of initial requirements. That you know that that product backlog which really isn't all that accurate, by the way. But anyways, we, you, know, um, you know, this stack of work items has got to come from somewhere. You know, we're going to be able, you know, these you know, requirements just don't magically appear, and they don't get beamed down from the Starship Enterprise, if you, you know, followed the panel yesterday. But, you know, they, you know, you got to do a little, bit of, a little bit of modeling up front. You know, you got to populate the, I'm sorry, you got to populate the backlog. I swore again, I said, I said modeling. Um, you got to populate the backlog, okay? Uh, or, or repopulate the backlog yeah, throughout the, you know, get a remodel uh, throughout the, uh, throughout the uh, construction as well. And you, you probably have to go hat in hand, get some funding for the project, because money just doesn't beam down from Starship Enterprise either. Um, yeah, she need, you know, somebody needs to sign off and fund your project. So there's a little bit of upfront work, and some people call this sprint zero or iteration zero. Um, that term is, of course, incorrect. Um, yeah, first of all, if, you, if, if, if people are, you know, are numbering backwards in time, you know, they, they didn't think a few things through. That's an indication right there. But um, it's not a sprint. Uh, and we know this because, well, at least I know this, because I do industry surveys. And the average construction sprint or iteration is roughly two weeks in length. Okay, that's pretty good. Um, but the average effort to start a project is four weeks. So that's either one hell of a long sprint or it's several sprints, or maybe it's not really even a sprint because it's a different animal completely. So we need to start thinking, but the same thing with the transition, by the way. Um, this is, I think, four and a half weeks on average. And obviously, you know, some people are doing transition in, on the order of minutes or hours if they're fully automated. Some people are transitioning in the order of months if they're fully dysfunctional. So um, I've seen some organizations that take three to four months to do transition of a of a system and they wonder why it takes them, it's so expensive to develop anything. But what can you do? So we need to be a little bit smarter about this. Um, and there's a few other things. This, this is the, uh, the, li the, the basic or the simple life cycle of uh, Dispin Agile delivery, which is based on Scrum. Uh, and there's a few other features that are interesting. It's uh, enterprise aware, so you should be working with the enterprise architects. I'll be talking about the and enterprise people in general. I'll talk about that later. And uh, it's scalable, which is uh, where we get in the next slide. So, like I said, this is for, you know, both of these things are for fairly straightforward situations. And what happens when the situation is not so straightforward? This is where things get interesting. So what does it mean to scale? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to walk you through eight scaling factors, one at a time. All the scaling factors are, are described in this sort of a format 
where on the left, from, from the point of view of the team, this is important for one of the scaling factors, for one, from the point of view of the team, the simpler situation to be in, or the desirable situation to be in, as the case may be, is on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side is the more difficult situation to be in, and it's actually an analog range. So you're co-located when all the people on the team are in the same room, including your key stakeholders, and you work together to get the job done. This is the desirable situation to be in from a geographic distribution point of view. Your success rates are the highest, your costs are the lowest, your risks are the lowest, this is a good thing. You're distributed, if you have people working in cubes, even though you're in the same building, you're now geographically distributed. You've erected barriers to communication, these are called cube walls. And there's a you know, wonderful series of cartoons, Dilbert, that you know, make fun of the challenges of working in cubes. And uh, they're right. Um, your, your success rate measurably goes down by several percentage points when, uh, when you work this way. Now, you know, if you're a small organization, a couple of percentage points, who cares? If you're a large organization, uh, you know, like if, if you're a Fortune 1000 company, this can translate into millions of dollars a year sometimes, your success rate going down by several percentage points because of the interior decorating decision to have cubicles, let alone offices, let alone having people working on different floors, let alone having people working in different buildings on the same campuses. There, there's wonderful studies that say that if you have people working in two different buildings, even though, they're side by, even though the buildings are side by side, so I work in building D and you work in building C, the chances of me talking with that gentleman, because he's in the other building, he's one of those, he's one of those C people. He works in building C. I'm not going to talk to him unless I happen to be on a softball team or some, or some other thing outside of work. That's the only, more than likely the only way I'm ever going to talk with this guy. He had, might as well be on the other side of the planet by that time. There's been studies that show this. Um, so, anyways, there's bad news. I've, I've done work that says it's not quite as bad as him being on the other side of the planet, but it's darn close. And so, and then let alone if you're, you know, globally distributed and you've got teams in different locations, and then your success rate plummets. And this is true of all, all paradigms, not just, uh, not just Agile. So avoid distribution um, if you can, and sometimes you can't. Um, so life's tough. Um, then you have large teams. We have te different team sizes. So you have teams of two people, teams of 20, teams of 200, teams of 2,000, uh, programs of 2,000. Um, it's not just a team by that point. And, uh, and, it's, uh, and oh, by the way, Agile works at all points in scale. I, I, like I said, I do surveys. I've got data that shows that I've got people reporting that they're succeeding in Agile at all levels of scale on all of the scaling factors we're going to talk about. So don't let anybody tell you that Agile does not scale. Please don't. They, they might know, if they tell you that, they're, what they're really saying is they don't know how to scale Agile. Okay, that's a different thing, right? They're, they're not communicating correctly, but they're telling you they don't know how to scale Agile, which is okay, they just don't know. Um, but other people have figured this out. So other people are succeeding at this. Doesn't mean that you will, but it is possible. Other people are. So um, we need to observe that and, uh, and act accordingly. Sometimes you have regulatory compliance. There was a, a, a talk earlier on today. Uh, it's easy when you have no regulatory compliance. And there's different types of regulations, by the way. So there's you know, Sarbanes-Oxley, Sarbanes -Oxley, which is reasonably trivial, all the way up to the FDA type regulations where you're you know, building uh, medical equipment or you're working in a pharmaceutical and you're, you're, doing you know, you're, you're um, supporting the development of drugs, not doing drugs. Well, you might be doing drugs, but um, you know, hey, why not? I'm from Canada. We're fairly liberal. So. Uh, we, all, we were this close to, le to legalizing marijuana, and then we voted conserv the Conservative Party into place, um, which is our version of the Republicans, if, you're, if you know the American politics. But anyways, um, that's okay. They won't last forever, so we'll, we'll eventually be able to smoke up. And uh, so anyway, so compliancy, that, it changes the way you work, right? You're going to have a little more documentation. You're going to be a little more careful. Um, a lot of the compliancy is around, you know, when it boils down to it, it's around risk management and uh, good stuff like that. The, um, one of the really good suggestions from the previous talk is to read the regulations. If you are in a regulatory environment, it behooves you to read the regulations. Because if you let, usually what happens, and this is a phenomenally stupid and ignorant thing to do, 
Uh, and it's the and as we saw, they 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 ran this uh, thing. You stand up if you've read, you know, sit down if you haven't read the regulations or things. Most people hadn't read the regulations in the last few years, and even though they were working in regulatory uh, environments. And what happens is, if you let the bureaucrats interpret the regulations, which most people do because they can't be bothered to read these phenomenally boring re regulatory documents, um, you end up with bureaucratic responses. You deserve what you get. If you're going to be that lazy, if you're going to outsource the interpretation, which is the fact of what you're doing, you're outsourcing to, to a bureaucrat the interpretation of your regulations, the bureaucrats will put together a bureaucratic strategy to address the regulations. The, if you let the practical people, and I hope you're all practical, if the practical people interpret their regulations, you'll end up with a practical response. Isn't that nice? So take a hit and read the regulations every so often. Yes, they're phenomenally boring, and what can you do? Uh, now, it's interesting. At this point in time, I usually like to, to make a point that um, it, different teams are in different situations. So my team... Might be, might, be you know, might be all in the same building, might be a team of five people in the same building in a non-regulatory environment. This gentleman's team could be spread across the planet, be 20 people in a regulatory environment. That gentleman's team could be 500 people on the same floor in a non-regulatory environment. That's okay. Different teams are going to work in different manner. A team of five people, I think it's pretty obvious that a team of five people will organize themselves differently, will work differently than a team of 50, than a team of 500. A team in a non-regulatory environment will organize themselves differently and will work differently than a team that is suffering from having to comply to Sarbanes-Oxley, who in turn will work differently than a team that's in an FDA regime. A team that's you know, co-located will very obviously work differently than a team that's uh, spread across a building, than a team that's spread across the planet. Different teams, different situations, different ways of working. So many of you have heard about ideas such as CMMI and, C and CMM who sometimes promote the idea, uh, and, and actually they don't if you were to actually read those regulations or read those, that guidance. Um, it often gets interpreted as we have to have a repeatable process. <laughs> what a phenomenally stupid and ignorant thing to do. Repeatable processes are complete and utter nonsense. That is useless bureaucracy. Useless bureaucracy. Nobody wants repeatable processes other than useless bureaucrats. What we really want are repeatable results. We want to spend the money wisely. We want solutions that meet our needs. We want systems out in a, in a, in a timely manner. We want sufficient quality. Nobody cares what processes you follow. Um, in, this morning, there was a gentleman talking about lean IT and, and their experience at their organization adopting lean stuff. It was a really good talk. And one of the things that he had, it it just mentioned offhand was that in their organization, they had adopted CMMI. They were like level five. They were doing Six Sigma. And they weren't getting the benefits. They were still, they were still unpredictable. They still had crap quality. They were, they, there, there were some serious challenges. The promises were not, because they were producing a lot of paperwork from the sounds of it. They weren't producing good solutions. So, and that's a perfect example of bureaucracy and not of discipline. So anyways, Avoid, you know, really don't, don't get in the trap of looking for repeatable processes. The, the different teams are in different situations. You need to tailor your process. You need to tailor your tools. You need to tailor the team structure to fit the situation you find yourself in. One size does not fit all, will never fit all, and it never, it never fit all, and it will never fit all. We need to be a lot smarter uh, about that. We need discipline. We need skill. Um, we need to be a lot smarter about the way we work. Sometimes you have domain complexity. Pretty, pretty straightforward to build an informational website. A little harder to build an e-commerce system. A little harder to build a, you know, the, the Watson system that wins at Jeopardy, or an air traffic control system, or a, the control system for a, a nuclear power plant. Okay? So different, pe different teams are in different situations. I would hope that the team working on a nuclear power plant works in a slightly more sophisticated manner than the team building a website. Gut feel tells me that would be happening. Sometimes we're organizationally distributed. Now, I'm sure none of you are involved in outsourcing here. But sometimes, some organizations split the work up. They do some of the work, and they have another company do some of the work. Or they partner. You know, sometimes there's companies who are partnering together. So, and this adds some complexity. It's pretty easy when everybody works for the same division of the same company. A little harder when you're working for multiple divisions. 
Harder yet when you're um, trying to partner with other similar companies to build some sort of inf shared infrastructure. Harder yet when you have outsourcing and contractors and all this sort of stuff that are, that's being thrown into play. Sometimes there's technical complexity. Yes, it's pretty, pretty easy when you're building a silo system that is you know, greenfield, so it doesn't have to connect to anything, brand new technologies, um, no legacy whatsoever, using all the whiz-bang tools. Yeah, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, some of us, though, are working in situations where maybe it's not the greatest, you know, the brand new technology anymore. Maybe it's not uh, a standalone system. Maybe we have some legacy code that we have to integrate with. Maybe there's some legacy code that we have to evolve and fix. Maybe there's some legacy data that we have to use. Maybe there's some legacy data that we darn well should be fixing because my data people don't know how to do it themselves. Not that I'm bitter about that. Um, Promote Satellite, I have, had a great talk a, a couple days ago, I hope, about uh, fixing databases and stuff like that. So it's a little bit more difficult than something. Than, and, yeah, so if we're in this, um, I, over lunch I was talking with somebody um, who had a situation where they were dealing with legacy code. Um, you know, how do you do legacy, you know, how do you fix, you know, work on a mainframe, and do agile on a mainframe and you know, fix this ancient COBOL stuff? Well, yeah, you gotta, you know, yes, it's possible, by the way, people are in fact succeeding at that. I mean, it's highly desirable to do because some of these COBOL programmers are getting a little old and are gonna retire soon. And that COBOL stuff is not going away, folks. Um, I, know, I now know people, I have friends who are working on source code that is older than they are. <laughs> I have absolutely no doubt that somewhere in the world there is a programmer right now working on source code that their father wrote. In a few years, it'll be their grandfather wrote it. I have no doubt that that's going to happen. Um, this source code stuff does not go away. Sometimes there's organizational complexity. It's not, often not this you know, big happy family we keep reading about. There's politics, there's uh, people in different parts of the organization that have very different ways that they want to work. Um, you know, some, you know, the, the CMMI folks might not appreciate the fact that I'm beating, up, beating up on them. But you can, in fact, do Agile and still be CMMI compliant. There's some wonderful writings on that if you, you, you choose to read them. Um, you know, sometimes the data folks have this very coherent, at least to them, this very coherent story for why they have to do these detailed logical data models up front, followed by detailed physical data models, and then, then and only then would the programmers be allowed to start coding. They have these coherent, well, they think it's coherent, but um, you know, regardless of all the evidence showing that it doesn't work very well, but they ha that's their religion. They believe in that, and they have a good story around it, and you still have to work with these folks. You still have to find a way to work together. Um, so this is, uh, you know, that brings a little, uh, a few complexities into the situation. And then finally, um, and this is the one where it's, it's a bit weird, um, the discipline teams actually want to be on the right-hand side, not on the left-hand side. Uh, and the basic idea here is you should be, have enterprise discipline or enterprise awareness. Um, you should want to um, be following common coding conventions. You should want to be working close with your enterprise architects to understand what the, your infrastructure is. What can I reuse? What should I be building out so that, that way other teams can reuse them? Where are my legacy data sources so that I'm not creating yet another customer database? Um, where, um, you know, how do I fit into the overall portfolio management stuff? How do we govern the teams effectively? Um, that would be a wonderful thing. Um, a lot of IT governance efforts are phenomenally dysfunctional. Um, you know, they're dysfunctional for the traditional teams, let alone for the Agile teams. Uh, and these stage gate documentation-based governance approaches are not good, uh, particularly not good for Agile, but uh, not that good for traditional stuff as well. So having an enterprise discipline can change, also will also affect the way that you tailor your process, the tailor your tools, tailor your, uh, the structure of your team. It was interesting that the previous speaker in here was talking about architecture and how architects fit on the team. And it was pretty clear that some people in the audience really were not getting it. Um, and it was like a foreign concept to them. And what happens is when you start having an enterprise discipline, I think actually enterprise discipline was in the title of her talk, um, or something very similar to that term, um, when you start looking at the bigger picture, you start changing the way. So she's in an environment where they were a little more mature and they realized they needed these architects on the team and that changed the team structure. 
it, they added an architect, and the architect did stuff and helped the team and you know, did whatever, right? Um, so it changed the team structure, let alone the process, and obviously the process they were following, and might, may even have changed the tools they were using. Maybe that architect started, you know, whipped out a modeling tool or something and started ooh, doing modeling. Um, so who knows? So anyways, interesting, uh, interesting observation to have. So how does this affect things? So let's walk through a few common practices. So how would I scale daily stand-up meetings, or a daily scrum meeting, whatever you want to call that? So first of all, when we move to a more disciplined approach, we start calling them by what, you know, instead of calling it a scrum meeting, which is a branded term, um, let's call it what it is. It's a coordination meeting. And there's different ways of, of holding it, of course. Um, but it's a, it, it's a coordination meeting. It's not a scrum meeting or a daily stand-up. Um, when you're geographically distributed, you're at least going to involve phones or maybe video conferencing or something, maybe even um, you know, typing, doing chat. I'm going to make all these slides available on the Agile site, on the, on the conference site, so you don't, you, don't, you don't need to worry about writing madly. Um, but yeah, you'll be doing uh, you know, some sort of electronic chatting or something. Um, and if they certainly won't be doing a stand-up meeting. Um, I've actually been in situations where the scrum, you know, so we, we have teams in multiple locations, and the scrum master on the phone is saying, I want everybody to stand up at their desk so we can have this stand-up meeting. <laughs> Do you really think that people are going to stand up to have a conversation over the phone? No, just boom, you know, stupid. Um, but anyways, what can you do? Um, when the team gets bigger, there's different ways you've got to deal with it. You, know, you can maybe have a scrum of scrums, um, and that's good for up to medium-sized teams. I'll talk about this in a bit. It, doesn't, it, it craps out with you know, really large teams. Um, or you could take the Kanban strategy, where they, they speak around a task board, and what they're really looking for is, what are the bottlenecks? What problems do you foresee? Because they don't need to worry about the stat. Because you know, if you're working closely together on the team, we don't need to hear the status, all the status reporting that occurs in the, in the scrum meetings, right? So if this group of people here was a big team, a team of, I don't know, 100 people, I don't know what it is, but say you're a team of 100 people, well, even if you're co-located in a really big room, um, I'm not working, I'm not really working with all 100 of these people today, right? I'm working with these three or four gentlemen across the front on a regular basis. And because I'm working, because I was working with them all day long yesterday, I got a pretty good idea what they did. They got a pretty good idea what I did. So they don't need to hear, you know, we don't need to hear our status. We know. The people over there, I, didn't, I haven't interacted with them for, for months now because they're not really part of my little group that, of doing whatever it is that we're doing. I could care less what their status is. As long as they're not screwing up and affecting me, or if I'm not screwing up and affecting them, we don't really care you know, what they did yesterday. They don't care, they don't care, I don't care what they did yesterday. I don't care what they're going to do today. They don't care what I did yesterday. I don't care, and they don't care what I'm going to do today. It's useless, extraneous information. And what they're waste, everybody's wasting their time hearing this stuff. So in Kanban, what they focus on is the real value. You know, what, you know, what's blocking us? You know, if there's nothing blocking us, hey, we're good to go. Stop the meeting, and let's go get some work done, right? Um, if we're in a regulatory compliance situation, maybe we're going to take meeting attendance. Maybe we're going to have to record action items, right? Because you've got to show that you're following the pro At least you're going to have to record the fact you held a meeting because uh, in some regulations, you've got to show that you're following, your, following whatever your process is. If you're organizationally distributed, so you've got different people working on different teams, you might not actually be a lot... You know, um, if you've ever worked in a, in, a, in a secret type of a situation or like a government situation, um, if you're working for the military, um, different teams might not, be even, might not even be allowed to know that the other teams exist let alone what they're doing, right? So you gotta be very careful about what, what status you're sharing. Or if you've got multiple consulting organizations involved. So I got, you know, I got TCS, I got WePro, I got IBM, and we're all working together for uh, you know, a bank in Europe. Um, chances are pretty good that the, the WePro people and the TCS people and the IBM people don't really wanna share details with each other, right? This is real world stuff now. So this is gonna change the way that we hold meetings. We're going to make sure that you know, the right, only the right people are talking with each other. Um, and if we've got enterprise discipline, we might have enterprise professionals showing up at the meetings. I might be inviting my portfolio management people to when I'm, you know, when I'm discussing project management issues. Or um, in my architecture meetings, I might bring in the enterprise architects and ask them to be involved. Um, if I'm really smart, I'll ditch the chicken and pig concept because I want those pe if I'm inviting those people, um, I want them to actually participate. You know, the chicken and pig thing is rather insulting and disrespectful if you, uh, you know, step back and think about it. 
And if you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, you're lucky. Don't worry about it. Okay, so scaling self-organization. Here's a con if you consider this a practice. Um, okay, so like I said, one of the very first steps when you're moving from the construction focus of Scrum to the delivery focus of, of DAD, the very first thing is we, do, we, we, we bring in the concept of appropriate governance, the adult supervision concept. Because um, this, is, this is what we see, this is the types of things we see in, in real enterprises. If we're in a regulatory compliance situation, um, you, know, what are, you know, these plans or these, you know, these estimates that we're talking about, we might have to record them. We might have to actually document them in a, you know, on more than just index cards in order to, in order to avoid fines and stuff like that. Um, if we have organizational complexity, um, organizational complexity is um, IBM's nice way of saying organization dysfunction. So if we have a dysfunctional organization, um, we, might, uh, you know, we, might, we might need to educate our management team on basic leadership stuff and basic facilitation stuff and why this self-organization concept is a good thing and why they should be promoting it. Um, you should be, we should be helping them get away from the command and control stuff. Uh, I ran a survey about a year and a half ago um, within the Agile community. I was at, trying, to, trying to judge how Agile people actually were. So I, you know, one of the I asked them, so are you Agile? Yes, okay, and then I asked a bunch of other questions to explore how Agile they were, and roughly half the people claiming to be Agile were Agile, in my mind, and I was being phenomenally generous. And one of the things that, uh, the most common thing that people uh, were not as Agile on as they should have been was self-organization. And I sus highly suspect the project management offices in their companies were getting in the way. They weren't allowing these teams to be self-organized, and they weren't allowing them to have stand-up meetings, they, or coordination meetings, I should say. They weren't allowing the, the developers to do the estimation and stuff like that. Um, they, were, they, they were still being told what to do. They were still being told what the plan was. Um, this is not good. This is, you know, this is hampering uh, people's agility to be successful. Uh, at the enterprise discipline level, uh, I might be bringing in uh, you know, the enterprise architects to help us uh, help drive some of our, you know, some of our um, um, architecture decisions, help motivate or help mentor some of our people in this stuff. I'm, uh, I might adopt some governance strategies from uh, lean development governance. So things change, different situations. So, so here's the interesting thing, right? So for both of these practices, it's still the same basic practice of having a, a coordination meeting every day, but different, because you're in a different situation, you'll have a different flavor of that practice. Same thing with self-organization, the flavor will change depending on what scaling factors affect you. The, um, if you're doing an iteration demo, um, it will change based on the situation you find yourself in. If you're distributed, you might be doing a webcast instead of a face-to-face -face demo. In a regulatory environment, you might have to take meeting minutes again. You might have to recontext. In other contexts, it's, it's really bad advice. So let's be clear about the context of the advice that we give. So, you know, so having a, a, a daily stand-up, that's great advice for when you're co-located. When, you're, when everybody's on the end of a phone line, telling them to stand up is a stupid thing to do, obviously stupid. So it's not really a stand-up meeting, it's a coordination meeting. So basic things like this. So, um, you know, the advice, the advice should depend. Um, okay, so some practices that you might want to adopt that maybe you haven't heard of, you know, maybe you, 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 you never heard in your, your two-day certification courses. Um, so first of all, you might want to think before acting. Um, this is what some of the Agile modeling practices are around. So in the Agile modeling uh, methodology, which uh, I, I led the development of over 10 years ago now, um, you know, we have a few practices for doing some upfront, you know, lightweight upfront requirements envisioning, some lightweight upfront architecture envisioning. By the way, 90 some odd percent of Agile teams do some upfront modeling, regardless of the rhetoric you might have heard. And that, that is information coming from Agile people. Because I, you know, I run surveys, I ask you know, a bunch of stuff, are you doing this, are you doing that, what's happening, blah, blah, blah. And 90 percent, over 90 percent of the respondents have, have, have very clearly said, yeah, we're doing some, some form of upfront um, requirements modeling, some, for, some form of upfront architecture modeling, some, front, uh, some form of upfront re uh, planning. Um, then you do modeling throughout the life cycle. Iterate, uh, modeling is part of iteration planning. So you're pulling user stories or, you know, what, or features or whatever off the stack, and you start talking about it. You might do a whiteboard sketch to figure out what the tasks are. You're at least talking about it. So modeling ends up becoming part of, uh, it's actually part of uh, your planning efforts. And um, it was actually interesting. I, I ran a survey just recently about planning and how, how people do planning throughout, throughout a, an Agile project. And one of the things I did, I luckily had, a, had an, open uh, 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 an open forum question 
where I was, when I was asking about um, initial modeling on a project, and roughly half of the response, like this is how, I was just shocked at this. Um, roughly half of the, of the respondents to this survey um, were talking about doing um, uh, initial requirements modeling, and they, were, they thought it was planning. So they were doing, yeah, so their idea of initial plan, which is okay, it's good that they're doing this, don't get me wrong, but they were struggling to communicate what they were doing. So they were doing initial, you know, they're doing, they're populating the backlog basically, right? So they're identifying a bunch of initial uh, user stories and prioritizing them, and then they, they said that this is my, you know, this is my planning activity. Well, no, that's initial modeling, and well, the prioritization is arguably planning. Okay, fine. But the, Creating the user stories, that's a modeling activity. So, you know, we need, to, we need to get better at communicating what the heck we're doing. But anyways, that's, that's an example of requirements and visioning, actually. Um, and then finally, you know, and we're doing do on documentation throughout the life cycle. Either we're doing continuous documentation within the iterations themselves, or, um, which, so if you want to be potentially shippable, that's the way you got to work. Um, Perhaps a better, uh, well, there's risks involved, but um, the most efficient way is actually to leave the documentation towards the end of the life cycle. Um, but you've got a very, but then you're not potentially shippable, um, so you get some very serious risks there. Um, cheaper to do, but there's some risks. So there's always trade-offs. There's no, no perfect situation. Um, and um, executable specifications, so writing tests instead of writing static, um, static documents. So instead of writing an SRS, you write executable um, acceptance tests, things like that. So, um, and it obviously requires skill and the right tools and discipline and all that sort of stuff. So there's a bunch of uh, practices in Agile modeling. And, and, you know, obviously, um, Agile modeling is not the only one talking about test-driven development, but um, those practices are there if you're interested um, at agilemodeling.com. Um, appropriate governance. So I, I used this term earlier. Um, what is appropriate governance? Good governance is based on collaboration and motivation and on enablement. So it should be based on human here. Command and control governance of you, follow my Java coding conventions or else. Chances are he's not going to do it, right? He's an intellectual worker. He's, he was probably just insulted because I had the nerve to tell him how to do his job properly, even though my Java coding standards are, in fact, fantastic. Um, he thinks better. He knows better. What does this guy know? Screw him. He's senior management. Pfft, idiot. But if I say, well, you know, you know, we've got these corporate coding conventions. It's really good. It would be really good. Um, we would like you to follow them because we'd really like uh, everybody to be f to writing the same basic code because it's easy. You know, if everybody's following the same conventions, it's e you know, if you have to update somebody else's code, you you'll be able to read it easier. If somebody else has to update your code, they'll be able to read it easier. Leads to better quality. You know, blah, blah, blah. A bunch of benefits for doing that. So I motivate him. Yeah, so that's a coherent story, right? People go, yeah, yeah, he's pretty, you know, a little inconvenient, but it, he's pretty much right. Okay, so their motivation is there. Then if I also say, oh, and by the way, here's this tool that you can throw into your continuous integration to check against the coding standard, so we can automate that, and I can, I can throw warnings. And so if you, if you break the coding, if you, if you go against the coding convention, I'll throw a warning the next time you compile, and, or the next time you build, and let you know that. So that way you can very quickly learn what the coding conventions are. Oh, making it easy now for me. So I motivate them to do the right thing. I make it as easy as possible to do the right thing. I also make it difficult to do the wrong thing. Because if he screws around and follows his own coding conventions, because he still thinks he knows better than me, he's going to get a heck of a lot of warnings. Coming out of the code, uh, coming out of the static code analysis, right? It's going to make it harder and harder and harder and harder for him to do the wrong thing. So reward the right things, punish the wrong things. That's going to greatly increase the chance that your teams follow and do do whatever it is that you desire them to do. So that's one aspect of governance. Another aspect of governance is, is monitoring the teams. So good governance should, if I'm if I'm on the governing body in your organization, my goal should be to help make it as easy as possible for your teams to do the right thing, to, you know, to, to get rid of um, some of the, the barriers to success. Um, you know, some of the things that they, they talk about Scrum Masters doing at the project level, we should also need to occur at the organization level. Uh, I, should be, I should be trying to make sure that you're, you know, you're building the right thing, that, that there isn't other teams out there, you know, so that this guy here, he's not working on an ERP system. This guy here, 
on the, you know, down the street in, in another building is also working on an ERP system. I don't need two ERP systems, right? So if I'm governing effectively, I should say, whoa, wait, what the heck is this? Um, and I should get these teams talking together and figure, you know, have them come to a, you know, motivate them to come to some sort of solution and have one ERP system to get the job done. Things like that. Um, I should also be doing, um, um, uh, hopefully have automated metrics, having, you know, letting the, if I adopt tools that generate the metrics for me, then I can have automated dashboards that show the metrics. If you want to get a, uh, uh, an example, is if you go, drop by jazz.net, you can see live project dashboards from several IBM teams in pro of, of building actual products in progress. And all of those metrics are being generated automatically by their tools. So the burn down charts, the defect trend analysis, um, the, the, the build history, and a bunch of other stuff, all those charts are being, are being generated automatically. No more of this you know, typing stuff into Excel or typing stuff into a point specific tool. All bureaucracy, by the way, even though it's blessed, the blessed bureaucracy of Scrum, it's still bureaucracy. You can automate all that away if you choose to. And that way you can actually focus on doing your jobs. And the beautiful thing about that is great for the teams because they can focus on doing their jobs as opposed to focusing on status reporting type stuff, like gen manually generating a burn down chart. Um, and um, better yet, um, if I'm the, you know, from the governance point of view, I, you know, I can get accurate um, real time, um, a real time assessment of what the heck's going on on the team. So if I, find, if, I, if I notice that something's going wrong, I can walk down the hall or hop on the phone or get on the chat system and ask what's going on. Is there anything I can do to help? So if I see that your build has been, been broken for a, a couple days, that might be a, a clue to me. Maybe I should give you a call because maybe you're running short of hard, you know, maybe you've got some hardware problems, you've got network problems, um, your build master died. I, who knows, right? Um, maybe I can help. So this is, this is the idea here. Um, and maybe I can make coherent decisions. If I know your actual status, I might be able to make real decisions to help your team. Um, as opposed to guessing. Um, it's interesting, you know, we, we like to make fun, you know, developers like to make fun of senior management, right? It's, you know, they're stupid, they don't know what they're doing. Um, and, and that's when they're being polite. It's not true, it's not true. These are smart people. They really are, they're smart people. They're doing the best that they can given the information that they've got. Well, if they're making what appears to be stupid decisions, well, it's, it's good decisions based on whatever crappy information they had. If we can improve the timeliness of the information, if we can improve the quality and the accuracy of the information, chances are managers will start making less stupid decisions. Because they are smart people who are actively trying to do the best that they can do. They really are. They're, they're good, decent people. They really are. And they're doing the best that they can do. So let's give them more accurate information. Let's help them understand what the heck is going on. That will increase the chance that they don't get in our way. Wouldn't that be nice? So anyway, something to think about. Another um, technique for, uh, at, that you might do at scale, um, something called ind parallel independent testing. So in Agile, we, we talk a lot about how the development team should be doing their own testing and whole team testing, all, this, all great stuff. TDD, love it. Problem is, it's not sufficient. So yeah, if I'm in a small team, in a small organization, yeah, whole team testing is probably going to get the job done. You assume you got the skills, right? Um, so we'll give the Agile teams the benefit of the doubt. So they got the skills, they got the tools, they know what they're doing. Let's assume that. It's not always true, but let's assume that for the sake of discussion. Even then, they could be in trouble. So in a few situations, I might have to have an independent testing team. In a regulatory environment, I'm probably going to have to have some form of, of independent testing. Most regulations imply that. Um, if I'm in a complex domain, if I'm doing a complex system, I might have some very interesting integration issues. So early, I was talking earlier, if, if I've got, you know, if, if, I, if I'm one of 20 teams in the organization, then I've got to make sure I'm testing against these other systems that are also in flight, that are also being developed. I can't do that. I don't have, this, I don't have the resources. I can't possibly keep track of these other 20 teams' builds. I can't possibly do all the integration work that I need to do to get them all up and running. I probably don't... I, you know, Regardless of the wonders of virtualization, and IBM is happy to sell you anything you need to do it, um, regardless of all that wonderful stuff, you're still probably not going to have the resources to simulate production in an intelligent manner. And you certainly will not have the resources, no organization 
has the resources to do it for individually for 20 different teams in flight, let alone 100 teams or whatever you've actually got up and running right now. So economically, you're going to have to have an independent test team that will do this pre-production system integration testing for me. So my team will push my build or make my, you know, make my, you know, my working build available to that test team. Your team will do it. Your team will do it. Your team will do it. And then the test team will do this harder form of testing of making sure everything works together well. And then when it doesn't, they report defects back to the individual teams. And they might be doing even, even other forms of testing, like security testing. You know, how, many, how many of you are working on systems where you have security experts on your teams right now? A few of you. How many of you are working on systems where you might have some security concerns because maybe you're, you're building a, a web-based system? Oh, uh-oh. Screwed, right? You're basically screwed if you've got security concerns and you don't have security people on your team. So you might want to be doing some security testing. So if the independent testers know this, that, oh, they're building a web-based system that's going to be deployed out to the internet. Oh, there's a few hackers out there that like to break into systems. Maybe I should do, maybe we should be doing some security testing, right? So, and because security testing is a skill, and there's expensive tools and stuff like that. And you're more than likely, you're not going to have the ability to put security experts on every single team. We saw this just now. More than likely, you're not going to have the money to buy expensive security testing tools for every single team. right? So economically, you're going to want to centralize. This is a bunch of different reasons um, for having independent testing. It's a phenomenally good idea. Um, and worst case, you know, if you put an independent testing team up and you find out that they're not finding any defects because the Agile team is actually doing a phenomenal job at testing, OK, fine. That's great. Now you know, you know, now you've verified that. If, on the other hand, you find, oh, this independent testing team is, in fact, finding defects early in the life cycle where they're, when they're inexpensive to fix, that's probably a good thing. I don't want to be doing testing at the end of the life cycle. I don't want to leave acceptance testing to the end. I don't want to leave integration testing to the end. That's the worst possible time to do testing is at the end of a project. The most expensive way of doing it. Well, actually, the most expensive way is to not do any testing at all and let your users test. And bad things really happen. But uh, yeah, I want to push testing to the front of life cycle as much as possible. So um, large team stuff, and then we'll, uh, we'll end up. So the basic idea here is how do you organize a large team? There's a lot of literature around how do you organize small teams. Um, but what happens when, you, when you've got a team that's you know, 100 people, 150, 200 people? Um, first of all, you're going to organize. You know, there's no such thing as a 100-person team. It's a, that, you know, that's a, that's a, a, a team of teams. So how are you going to coordinate these subteams with each other? Um, so if you're only three or four subteams, then yeah, doing a daily scrum of scrums where you, you, know, you share your status and all that sort of stuff with each other, that'll probably get the job done. Um, but when you're in a larger situation, you've got a larger team than that, um, the scrum of scrums concept starts to fall down. And because what's happening here is there's three, maybe four things that you're coordinating. First, you're coordinating basic project management stuff. Um, you know, how are we, you know, you know, what's the current status? How much money are we spending? You know, you know, do we have people, are we onboarding people? Are we offboarding people? And if I've got a team of 100 people, chances are pretty good one or two per people left this iteration. One or two people got hired on this iteration. So I got, a, I got these basic management stuff of bringing them on and off. If I've got a 100 person team, um, I don't know, you know, I don't know what your, what your charge rates are here, but it's, you're spending a fair bit of money every week. You, you probably should be tracking it. So there's some basic project management, program management stuff that should be occurring here. Um, somebody should be making some coherent decisions. Um, you, know, you should be coordinating the activities between the teams. Then on the um, requirements management side of things, the product, you know, so the, the sub there's dependencies, functional dependencies between requirements, between the, the different sub-teams have got. So you've got to manage these things. So if, my, you know, so if my team is working on something right now, and we, we uh, expect a feature that this gentleman's team is working on, then they need, if, it's, if, if we're managing things accordingly, his team will either be doing it in the same iteration as mine, or in an iteration before. Because if I depend on him to deliver something, and I, we're both in iteration five right now, but his product, his product owner has prioritized it down to iteration nine, the things that I need in iteration five, I'm out of luck. I'm going to have to mock it out or whatever. And as soon as I mock something out, I'm no longer potentially shippable. I now have a risk. So what we should do is the product owner should get together and negotiate. I need it in iteration five. He thinks it's going to be iteration nine. 
Maybe we split the difference. Maybe he prioritizes up. Maybe I prioritize down. But something's got to occur so that way everything works out well. Right? So there's different, you know, so it's this prioritize simply based on business value. Interesting and quaint concept for small teams. Uh, for larger teams, reality gets in the way sometimes. So stuff like that happens. And then there's technical issues that you've got to coordinate. Uh, so you'll have an architecture owner on your team or an architect, depending on your, con on your uh, terminology, and they'll be part of the overall um, architecture team for the, uh, you know, for the overall uh, program, and they'll, they'll be negotiating uh, technical issues as time goes on. And you know, so people on the team will be bringing stuff up, and they'll be wor everybody will be working together. Um, and then finally, there's probably a, an overall program manager keeping an eye on all this stuff. Um, and managing it all, because you've got a 100-person team, I would hope you know, there's at least enough work to keep one person um, busy coordinating everything. Um, even just running the, uh, pro, you know, the leadership team um, is often enough. So, each, so the, the team lead, or the, you know, the scrum master in each team is part of the program ma uh, project management team. Um, the product owner is part of the product ownership team. The architecture owner in each sub-team is part of that team. And then all these people together form the leadership team. Um, so that's the basic idea there. So these, these are some of the ways that you're going to be um, organizing larger teams. Um, you'll probably have independent testers involved, um, which might be a sub-team all by itself. You might even have an, uh, an inter you know, something like a build master or an integrator person because the integration effort is so difficult now because of, of the complexity um, of, that you're implementing. Um, there's a couple strategies. Um, around. There's different ways to organize. There's great religious debates, um, all of which are inane. Um, around how do you organize large teams. So 